You know, if you weren't here uh, this fall when Matt and Will shared that message, go watch it. <laughs> go watch it this weekend. And, and I would even encourage you to share it with others as, as we honor MLK Day tomorrow. Um, because it shows that even though evil is at work in our world, God is at work even more, right? And so I, I and, and that's why we're in this vintage faith series, because you know what our world needs is for those of us who claim to follow Christ to grow in that relationship, not to point people to people, but, but to point people to God, to lead people to understand God's will and ways and heart. And so we're, we're in this series trying to help us understand the seasons of the spiritual journey that happens across a lifetime. And if you, if you weren't here last week, go back and listen to that on our Gateway Church uh, app or, um, or a website or YouTube because this builds one on the other. You won't, get, you won't understand it if you don't understand it all. So I gave you this picture that, uh, that we are using for a picture of the spiritual life. Um, if you guys can put that up. And I, I said, think about your life like a mansion uh, with, with seven dwellings. And at the center, uh, when we let God into our lives, God dwells in the very center. And his light begins to permeate our lives. And now, we talked about how it may not feel like the very source of light and life and love and joy is in our lives because we all start at this outer dwelling called new beginnings. And a lot of the light and love of God gets filtered out because of other things, things that God wants to do in us so that we might experience his light and his love. And then we talked about um, how God gives us glimpses of this to woo us, to trust him, to move toward his light toward the center. And we talked about dwelling too. These are, these are dwellings or they're seasons in which we w live with God. And the second dwelling was called failing forward. And we talked about how in this season we're bombarded with temptation. We fall, we feel condemned. This season feels like failure, but it's actually not failure. Not if you learn to fail forward. It's more like learning to walk as a baby right? That God is like a good parent helping us, that falling is a part of learning to walk as you learn your balance. And, and even in the, the falling and the failing, we're learning how to overcome temptation by depending on God's power that is within. This is what the whole recovery movement is based on, this truth that God is willing to help us overcome by his power. Now, we said last week, these dwellings or seasons are not linear. So you might find yourself in one and then two and then three, and then you might find yourself back in an area or a season back in two before you move on to, to four. And then you might taste four and come back to three before it, you make it more of your permanent way of living with God. But understanding how this journey works across a lifetime and, and how we move is critical. So today we're talking about dwelling three good disciples, and, and dwelling for. So disciple, the word disciple just means a student, a learner, a follower, an apprentice. Jesus talks about it in John chapter 8 and 15. He, Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then in John 15, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So season three is a season of activity, of following Jesus as an apprentice, learning to follow his ways. And, and many Christians live and camp in the season for, for decades. You know, in the church, most spiritual formation teaches about these first three dwellings, and pretty much that's it. And, and, and so many times we don't realize that there's more, that, like we're going to be talking about. But here in Dwelling 3, you know, that intense spiritual battle that raged in Dwelling 2 has largely ceased. We, we, have, we feel victorious. We've learned to overcome by God's power. Now, it's not that we don't sin. It's not that we're not tempted. It's just that those, those addictions, those sin patterns, that we, we were slaves to them, and it felt impossible. And now we can resist, and, and we've learned to resist 
And we don't really want to go back to the old way because we're starting to realize that following God's way and will is so much better. We're, we're experiencing a new freedom following Jesus, a new peace and joy and love. In this dwelling three season, we've, we've come to understand a lot about the character of God because we've been reading and studying the Bible and we understand more and more uh, of God's will and we want to trust him more. Prayers become a regular part uh, of our life as is church and spiritual community. You know what we were just talking about, how important it is to you know, have a smaller group of, of, of spiritual friends or what we call around here spiritual running partners. One or two people that you will be completely honest with and you pray for each other and walk together. That's all a part of, of learning to walk with God in Dwelling Three. Tom Ashbrook, um, who, who wrote a, a book talking about these ancient dwellings that we're basing this on, says this, as you and I mature in the third dwelling, we become fully convinced that life with Jesus is the only way to live. We've experienced in many specific situations the truth that Jesus will lead us faithfully if we follow his teachings. A scriptural worldview and moral values have replaced old worldly ones. We try to avoid committing even minor sins, not to be good, but, to, but because we've seen enough evidence that God's ways are better. So we want to follow his will. So in this season, our, our prayer life is becoming richer, fuller, more, more balanced. In, in dwelling too, our prayer life was mainly, it was about us, right? It was like, help me, you know, stop this temptation or give me this or that. Uh, and, and that's okay, you know, God is incredibly patient with our growth in each season, whatever season we're in. But in season three, our prayer life is expanding. Um, maybe you learned uh, Acts, Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. You know, we're learning other ways of prayer. Adoration, we're, we're learning to adore God. In other words, just in prayer to talk back to God about what we've learned that we love about him, right? It's, it's adoration. This is the beginning of intimacy. You know, kind of like when you're in an intimate relationship, when you tell the other person things you love about them, it creates intimacy, and then confession, which we talked about and learned about last week, you know, continues on. But we add to it thanksgiving. Not just in prayer, but all throughout the day as we learn to practice thanks. We start to realize that every good thing we've ever loved about life is a gift from God out of his love for us. And as we learn to recognize and thank him, it's us giving back love to God. And that grows our intimacy as well. And then supplication, which just means asking, <laughs> asking for stuff in faith. Maybe it's asking for others called intercession, or maybe it's asking for ourselves. But our spiritual eyes start to open as we see God answering prayer in this dwelling. Now, he doesn't answer all our prayers, no doubt. But when we see him answer prayer, it teaches us about God's will and ways. And a genuine experience of this hidden God begins to happen more and more as we trust more and more. Now, what's God doing in this season? God is inviting you into friendship and partnership in his work. I mean, isn't that amazing to think about? God is inviting you into friendship and partnership. Jesus said this about, about this season in, in John chapter 15. He says to his friends, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everything I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. And you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit. Do good things. See good things happen, come out of you. And fruit that will last. This is a fruitful season. This, this is a season of, of obedience to God where we're experiencing more friendship with God. And God grows us as he brings us into cooperation with what he's doing in the world. See, he's gifted you. He's uniquely created you. And believe it or not, the, the creator of the universe loves to partner with you to bring about restoration and healing of our, of our broken, hurting world. The apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 6. He says, as God's co-workers. Look at that. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. And do you realize this? That God is inviting you when you're in this season, and, and that's, that comes in time. 
He's inviting you into his business, what he's doing in the world as a coworker and a friend. You know, the Bible paints another image or picture of this. It says in Romans 12, uh, 5, in Christ we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. Talking about us, the church. And we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If your gift is prophesying, prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, teach. If it's to encourage, give encouragement. If it's giving, give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. See, in this season, we're starting to realize that that spiritual growth, to keep progressing with God toward the center, toward more of his light and love, can't be just about us. It's about us cooperating with God to minister to others, to serve others, to do for others, but not just on our own, in connection with God's spirit. So what can we do to keep growing in this season? Well, explore ministry and service. Discover your gifts. God's given you gifts. And, and start asking him and trusting him to guide you into a, a ministry or service that, that he intended for you. Because when you do, it will bring you alive, but also you'll experience his pleasure. You'll experience his pleasure as you watch him working through you to make a difference in the lives of others. You know, we're, we're discovering in this season, it's not just about ourselves, that in Christ we form one body and we all belong to each other. In other words, God wants to teach us his interdependency. See, God wants us to be dependent on him and interdependent on one another. And we can't really grow into all God desires if we don't start to move toward this. We can't just remain isolated to ourselves. So let me ask, do you know your spiritual gifts? You know, have you explored the, the ministry God might want you to do if you're in this season? And, and let me just say, you know, uh, Dr. Eric Bryant, our South Campus pastor, is going to be holding a Thrive workshop called Advance. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you discover your strengths, your gifts, your temperament. You'll get coaching uh, personally to explore areas of service or ministry that you might try. I want to encourage you to go do that if this is where you are. And, and by the way, Go check out that Thrive page on our Gateway website because we have all kinds of workshops, short-term online workshops to help you thrive in this season. So, so take advantage of that and go find what will best help me move forward. Kind of give me that push forward in this season. But you know, I gotta say, my growth took an exponential leap when I stopped just taking in and I actually started giving out. When I started leading my first small group and helping uh, others discover and learn what I was learning, man, my growth shot up. It was so fulfilling. When we don't do that in this season, when we get stuck, you know, th this I think is what Jesus is referring to. The risen Jesus says in Revelation 2, I think to people stuck in season three or dwelling three. When he says, I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance, but... I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other like you did at first. You've lost that first love. You know, and, and are you doing, doing a lot for God, but, you know, you're not really doing uh, it out of love for God? Well, that is what evil is trying to get us to do in this season. You know, that's how evil uses this season uh, against us is, is we get real busy serving God, but we forget relationship with God. And sometimes when this happens, God creates a holy dissatisfaction in us. And, and God's doing this to draw us closer to God. Now, evil tries to get us busy and, and disconnected from God's love. And God might, in love, allow a dissatisfaction to grow in us. And, and he's trying to move us toward dwelling for. You know, or a, a disruption of how things are supposed to work. Kind of throws us off. And again, this is to help us move toward dwelling for. But what happens is evil tries to get us to direct this dissatisfaction externally 
instead of what God's trying to do is draw us toward himself. So maybe, you know, you've been in the season for a while, you've been doing ministry, you've been serving, you've been, you know, you do, you're doing all the right things. You know, life is good, right? And then this kind of dissatisfaction, you, you, you feel a need for more, you want more. It's a good thing. God's drawing you closer to himself. But what evil does in this season is tries to get you to blame others. It's your church's fault. They don't teach deep enough. You know, you need to go somewhere that can meet your needs. And it's funny, but uh, this is so common. It's like parents with teenagers. They always hear the same thing. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, you don't know anything. And, and they got to go find it somewhere else. Well, churches always get this criticism when people get to this place. But here's the problem. Evil wants to get us blaming others and seeking external solutions because what we really need is to go inward. What we really need is to seek God in silence. And that's what we're going to talk about. Evil's trying to distract you from solitude and abiding. So Ashbrook says it this way in his book. He says, two primary tactics used on us in dwelling three are pride and distractions. The enemy will attempt to convince us that we're really important, really mature, better than most. After all, look at all we're doing for God. But what he's doing is telling us we're so important to keep us busy and distracted. Anything to distract us from solitude and abiding. Teresa of Avila, the, the 15th century writer on this spiritual formation that part of this is taken from, says this. Although there's a prayerful communication with God in this third dwelling, we've yet to find any real spiritual joy in prayerful intimacy with God. That's to come in the later dwellings. But God may give us a taste so we will want more or give holy discontent that makes us want something more. Otherwise, we may stay here indefinitely. And she says, I've known people who have reached this state and have lived many years in this upright, well-ordered way. And I got to tell you, friends, looking back on my own journey, it's fascinating. You know, I probably spent one or two years in, in dwelling one, bouncing back and forth between one and two, probably two or three years in, in dwelling two. I spent 15 years in dwelling three. And part of it I, as a pastor in full-time ministry, okay? Now, that's not necessarily bad, okay? There's seasons, but this season we can tend to get stuck in. Because it's good. It is good. So what moves us forward? Disruption. God's disruption. He wants to move us toward dwelling for finding love. Finding his love in a deeper way. And so God in love will disrupt our if-then paradigms that we all get ourselves into. You know, in many ways, it goes something like this. If I'm following Jesus and I'm doing ministry and I'm avoiding sin and this, that, and the other, then, right? And just fill in the blank. God should, life should, things should. And then God takes that away. It doesn't work that way. Now, what God's doing is removing the props, the attachments, sometimes even religious attachments that we've, 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 we're holding on to for security or for our identity, but they're actually blocking us from moving forward. They're blocking more of his light and love from coming to us. Teresa talks about the difficulty between dwelling three and four. She says, after these years, when it seems they've become lords of the world, she's saying that tongue in cheek, at least clearly disillusioned in this regard, the Lord will try them or test them in some minor matters, and then they'll go about so disturbed and afflicted, it puzzles me. <laughs> it's useless to give them advice, for since they've engaged so long in this practice of virtue, they think they can teach others and that they're more justified in feeling disturbed. And this exact thing happened to me. Uh, and I'll tell you, it was the greatest gift ever, but I hated it when it was happening. And it was the greatest gift because it dislodged me and moved me toward experiencing dwelling for. So I had been in ministry a decade when I got the clearest call from God I'd ever gotten that, that led us 
to start Gateway Church for people who are far from God. And, um, you know, I find that many times God gives clearer communication. And by the way, I've never heard an audible voice from God. It's, it's these thoughts in our minds. But this was the clearest I'd ever gotten. It was no, no doubt to me. But many times I find God gives very clear communications to help us endure the temptation or tests that are coming. That was true of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, if you, if you read her books. But what happened is I, we started Gateway, and we were going to launch in the Great Hills General Cinema Movie Theater uh, over in the Arboretum. And we had, we had spent all our money getting ready for launch Sunday, you know, inviting people to come. It was two weeks from the day we were going to launch, and the L.A., management of General Cinema calls me and says, you can't meet, do church in our movie theaters. That's bad for business. I said, I have a contract. So that manager didn't have a right to sign the contract. And I tried for a whole week to get them to change their minds. And we're only one week out from all these people showing up. And uh, so we have a prayer vigil, you know, and I'm on my way out the door to, to pray and beg God to do something. When I get a phone call from a pastor friend in Cincinnati, and he said he wanted uh, to connect someone moving to Austin to our church. And I said, well, if we have a church, <laughs> and I explained to him what had happened, and he said, huh, you know, I think there's someone in my church who knows someone in the movie industry. I'll, I'll talk to him. And I hung up, thought nothing about it. We prayed. So the next week, I go into the local manager to just beg him to give us one Sunday. All these people are going to show up. And when I walk in, he says, well, you guys have good contacts. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? He said, you don't know? I said, know what? He said, the, the president of General Cinema in New York City called the office in Los Angeles and said, work it out with the church in Austin. So you guys are good to go. <laughs> and we praised God. We were blown away. You know that God had, had prompted Brian, my pastor friend in Cincinnati, to call just at the right moment. And he had shown us his power to work things out. And honestly, I thought we were bulletproof. I thought we'll be here as long as we want. Nine months later, they started showing the movie, The Spy Who Shagged Me, and they needed our theater and kicked us out. We got kicked out by Austin Powers. Okay? I could say it another way, but I won't. I made that mistake in Australia once. Don't do that. <laughs> but that was that began two years of the most painful time because for two years we moved to six different locations sometimes with only four days notice once we had to move times or locations every week for six weeks and we were reaching people who are far from God and struggling and we'd reach them and we'd lose them and in, I mean we, we had to change our motto from come as you are to come if you can find us All right and it was brutally painful because, friends, I didn't understand what God was doing. Now, what's God doing in this, in this season? Well, like Teresa said, the Lord will try them or test them with some minor matters. And he's doing it to draw us closer. But we go about so disturbed and afflicted. And I was disturbed and afflicted. And I'd get on my mountain bike and I'd ride out in, into the hill country. And I'd spend hours praying. I mean, really complaining. I was just complaining. <laughs> you know, what, what are you doing, God? I mean, look, you told me so clearly to come and start this church to reach people. We're reaching people. You're, and we keep having to move and we lose them. Why, you're, you're God. You could stop this. Why don't you do something? And friends, it took me a year of weekly going into solitude for an hour or two with all my if-thens, right? If I, I thought, then you would and getting no, no answer before I finally started to learn to be quiet. And you guys, God doesn't speak audibly. Not, it hadn't to me. But God speaks. And we only learn to hear his voice when we learn to get quiet. And as I got quiet, over and over I heard this thought very clearly in my mind. I knew that I wasn't thinking. Am I enough? Over and over, as I would get quiet... In these hours of solitude, week by week, I kept hearing God asking me, am I enough? And honestly, it made me mad at first. I was like, what do you mean, am I enough? I left engineering to go into ministry. You know, I left this great job in Chicago to come start this church. I've been through a, what do you mean? 
but just kept asking, am I enough? And it was very painful, friends. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you, but it was the path to the greatest gift. And I wanna encourage you, if you're in pain or disillusion, don't run from God, angry at God. Run to silence. Run to solitude. So as I did, I started to realize, I guess the answer's no. In other words, what God was showing me is that just receiving his love and loving God and loving my family and loving the people who did come to our church that wasn't enough. I needed things to go a certain way. And when they didn't, I got very frustrated and angry with God. And God was revealing attachments that I had that were blocking God's love. Identity and my value, it was still very tied to succeeding or accomplishing. And God was, God was trying to get rid of that so that I could have a new identity that was not circumstantial. But I had to let go. I had to let the old die in order for the new to come. And so I started to practice daily surrender during this time. Every day, not my will, God, your will. And I would just try to surrender throughout moments throughout the day. And I started to find a surprising joy coming. I mean, a joy that was better than anything. And it, it just, it would come at surprising moments. And I later realized this is what Jesus was talking about in John 15. I think he's talking about this dwelling for season when he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me like a vine connected to a tree, you will bear fruit. Fruit grows naturally. But apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't grow spiritually apart from the God who created you. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Now remain connected to my love. When you obey my commands, you remain in my love. I've told you these things so that you'll be filled with joy, so your joy will overflow. This is dwelling for. This is finding love. And friends, it's a far deeper love and joy than, than I had ever experienced. Now, and now listen, I knew God. I loved God. And I'd experienced God's love. I had been a pastor for a decade, but this was exponentially better, truly. And it radically altered my prayer life. I mean, up until then, you know, I prayed and I could pray 30 minutes or 40 minutes, but it felt like work, honestly. You know, I had to really focus and concentrate. My mind would, would wander. But now I could spend one, two, even three hours walking and talking with my friend, with Jesus. And, and it wasn't work. I left feeling filled up. It was life-giving. You know, Oswald Chambers says it this way. Once taste God, and nothing but God will ever do again. And that was what I was experiencing. Those trials were for a reason. They're to drive you to solitude and surrender, because there you find something it's much better than anything else. A love and a joy that, I mean, you only want that. So what can we do? Well, these two things, solitude and then staying connected like a, like a branch to a tree. So the first is learning to be alone. Going into nature or, or going to some cozy place that you like to be. And learning to get quiet enough to listen to hear God's voice in your mind. Now, silence is difficult. Let me tell you why. Because we've spent all our lives running from looking at what's inside. Because there are things that block God's voice, God's light, and God's love. There are wounds, there are fears, there are idols, there are false identities. And this is exactly why God wants to lead us into silence. Because that's where he begins to heal and cleanse and change our very heart and identity, so that it, it can't be taken from us. So regular solitude and daily surrender is what I started to practice when one Saturday, my kids come running in from out back and said, fire! And there was a fire in the easement uh, back behind our house. And I went back there and helped put it out. And Joe, who was a neighbor across the easement, helped me put it out. And after we did, he said, hey, how's that church thing going? I hadn't talked to him in two years since we started the church. And, he, and I said, oh, it's going great, but we keep getting kicked out of places, out of facilities. And he said, huh, 
funny, you know, I just became the CEO of a retirement manor on Mopac, and we just bought a synagogue that we're going to tear down this month. And just this week, I started feeling bad about just tearing it down. And I said, you ought to feel bad about tearing it down. Let me go look at it. And I went and looked at it, and it was perfect for us. It was amazing. I came back, and I said, Joe, we've got to do a deal. We can offer you $3,000 a month. And he laughed. Yeah. It was, it was 24,000 square feet, $3,000 a month. He laughed. He said, we'll save more in taxes tearing it down. My board will never go for that. I said, just take it to them. They agreed for one year, which turned into two, three, four, five. We went from... 200 people to reaching 2,000 people who, who, who were struggling or felt far from God. It was amazing. And then they tore the place down. But think about it. God knew. He was keeping us from being able to sign a lease, which was frustrating the heck out of us because he had a blessing in store, but we had to wait. But even more important is what he was doing in me. Through all the frustration. Surrender, silence, learning to hear his voice. Don't run from God when things aren't going the way you want. Run to him in solitude. So I did that, and out of that came what we've called the 60-60 experiment. And this is another practice you can try. Sol silence and solitude, and try the 60-60 so what I started doing, like I said, is I would wake up every morning and I would just pray, okay, God, you're God and I'm not. So today, I want to surrender my will and I want to seek your will and ways more and more. I was trying to do what Jesus said. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. In other words, staying connected is all you have to do and fruit grows in your life naturally. But apart from that, you can't grow spiritual fruit on your own. That's what Jesus is saying there. So this is the one thing I would focus on all day, every day, as much as I could. Just this ongoing walking with God, ongoing conversation with God, remembering he loves me, and, and ex try to experience that love. And then radical willingness, if I hear a prompting thought, to obey it, to do what God is telling me. And as I did this simple thing, he started to do things inside of me I could not manufacture for myself. Fruit. Now, here's the deal. I realize I need lots of reminders to stay connected to God because my habit, I bet it's yours too, is to forget about God most of my day. I get busy and worried and try to get my stuff done and I don't even think about asking God, hey, what are you doing here? What do you want done here? Or even to experience his, his love uh, and kindness throughout the day. But as I started to put reminders, I started to get better at it and I was amazed you know, like I said, I was experiencing things, joy and, and love that I hadn't experienced in 15 years as, uh, following Jesus as a Christian. I was, I was able to just be in the moment and, and experience my kids, you know, be present with them and my wife and, and, and to have, you know, empathy for people and connect with people in a deeper way than I ever had. And like I said, this unexplainable joy I mean, really, that, that would just come out of me, not something circumstantial at all. And it was so good that one day I was asking God, God, how do I help our church learn to stay connected to you long enough to do this? And I had this idea come into my mind. I don't think it was my idea. Do an experiment for 60 days. 60 days is how long it takes to form a new habit. We call it the 60-60 experiment because the idea is you set an alarm or put reminders up so that every hour, every 60 minutes, you're reminded to connect with God, to stay connected throughout each hour. And I wrote the book Soul Revolution about this because I can't teach enough in a, in a short amount of time of, of how it works. Because it, it's not praying every 60 minutes. It's not like we're trying to, you know, beat the Muslims at five prayers a day, doing 12 or 16 a day. It's not that, okay? Instead, it's shifting your perspective to do life every moment with God. And so what we do is realize we're, we're in the habit of ignoring God. So you set your, your watch to beep every hour, or now we have a Soul Revolution app. You can get it out on the app store, and it'll, if, you, if you put your, the sound on your phone on, it will, it'll ding you or remind you, and then a verse and a prayer will pop up. 
But the idea is, is this. Let, in fact, let's just imagine it together, all right? So imagine you're doing the 60-60 experiment. You're going through your day. Maybe you're in a meeting, and, and it, it dings. It reminds you. And maybe you're still in the meeting, okay? But you can just, in your mind, you say, Lord, you're with me. You love me. That's, that's your promise. Help me experience more of your love right now. And, and, and God, you, you want to guide me. You care about even this meeting I'm in, everything. And you want to guide me through it. What's your will right now? You know, is there anything you want me to hear or do or say? How did I do last hour? Did I forget about you all hour? Or did I stay connected? Celebrate that. How can I better stay connected? You're just having little, a little conversation. And then you're trying the next hour to be more aware throughout that hour. That's all you're trying to do. Solitude, though, and staying connected, that's what helps grow you in dwelling for. So that you start to experience more and more of the fruit that Jesus promised, the love and the joy. Now, quick note of what evil is doing in this season. Ashbrook says, distraction is a major scheme of the enemy against us. As we fall in love with Jesus, evil attempts to keep us from recognizing God's touches. Oh, no, that's just a coincidence. Blow it off. Don't think about it. Don't thank God. Or through busyness and cluttered thoughts, specific attacks are directed against our efforts at solitude, contemplation, or silence. Because this is where we learn to differentiate God's voice, his thoughts in our minds from our own. Now, again, this is not linear, right? Right? And you may get a taste of dwelling four and then go back mainly in dwelling two for a little bit and then move on to mainly dwelling three before you mainly live in, in dwelling four. But the idea is we live and we move forward where we are. Listen to Brian's experience. Um, he kind of had that experience of jumping to dwelling four, back to two, then to, to three. Um, Brian is one of our leaders at Central Campus, but years ago, he got um, his third DWI, driving while intoxicated, was sentenced to mandatory recovery. While in recovery, he decided to give God a try. He, he had been an atheist. Starts to pray every night. And during that time, a friend invited him to Gateway. He came to faith in Christ here. And we were doing our first 60-60 experiment. And Brian recalls how as he learned to just stay connected, God did grow fruit within him. He said, as I experimented with staying connected... I experienced peace and joy as a way of life. That was probably the biggest gift of all because I used to be angry, depressed, isolated, fearful, and even hopeless. Knowing peace was huge. He said this fruit that Jesus talks about is also a former porn addict who now sees the beauty of a woman's soul rather than just a selfish thrill. And I experienced this fruit one morning about two months after the first 6060. I was connecting with God and I realized I was no longer looking at porn. And then it hit me. I never even made a conscious decision to stop. God just took the desire away as I stayed connected. Stay connected, fruit grows. Fruit, Brian says, is hunger to read the entire New Testament after that first 6060. And then coming to a conviction on my own about sex outside of marriage. I found Jesus' view of women changing my view of women as valuable spiritual creatures to honor. Fruit is a former alcohol abuser who no longer needs the crutch and realizes crutches just hold you back. Fruit is learning how to be known, how to know and be known in community rather than just isolate. And fruit is being able to go on for hours and hours about all the ways God has guided me and walked with me and given me more joy than I could have ever imagined as I just stayed connected. See, friends, Jesus' words are true. You might not be in this season yet. You can still experiment with these things, but he's patient with you wherever you are. But understand how to move forward and move toward his light and his love. Well, all these steps, all these exercises are in the next steps, which you can find on our website or on our Gateway app. We're gonna, we're gonna sing a song uh, as we close. Speak to me. And I want to encourage you as you listen to these words to make them your prayer. That God, let me hear your voice that I might follow you. Let's pray together real quick. God, I do pray 
that you would teach all of us. And we want an audible voice, but it's much more direct communication to hear your thoughts and our thoughts. But you want us to be silent, to learn to listen deeply. And there you're going to lead and guide us. Thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name, amen.